Okie dokie, folks. So anyway, what you see back here is an image that's very stereotypical of World War I, right? People fighting in trenches. Uh, steel helmets were developed during this war. Believe it or not, they start the war without helmets. Also, trench warfare, I don't want to say it was invented, but it became the major way that they fought using that American invention of barbed wire. Artillery becomes just devastating. And of course, some of the weapons, and we'll be talking about these on Monday or Tuesday, like gas warfare, y'all, flamethrowers, airplanes, um, zeppelins and things like that will all be developed during World War I. People get really innovative during, during wartime. Okay, now I'm gonna open this with a song called, Oh, What a Lovely War. Oh, 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 it's a lovely war. Now that's from a musical called Oh What a Lovely War that kind of pokes fun at this whole way that this crazy war started, y'all. Now, so what do we call this war? And I only included this slide because I have students that have gotten confused. They think the World War was different from World War I or some even think the first world war was different from World War I, okay? You guys are smarter than that, but I just wanna make sure of that. But there are a couple of names that you should know that people sometimes call this war. Some people call it the war to end all wars because y'all, they thought this war was so bad, how bad was it? That there would never ever be another war because this would just exhaust us. Nobody would let a war happen. And that's kind of the way the Americans acted after the war. Also, some people call this, in fact, our own president, Woodrow Wilson, called this the war to make the world safe for democracy. The war to make the world safe for democracy. The reason, y'all, was that there were several different um, monarchs who were in power. And some of these monarchs, y'all, had complete power, like the, like the Tsar of Russia the Kaiser of Germany. These people were essentially inherited dictators, right? And the idea when we join the war is we're gonna help get rid of these eagles and replace them with democracy. And that kind of sort of happened. Um, the fall of eagles, because once again, you had three countries, y'all, Austria and Hungary and Germany and the Russians who had eagles as their symbol. And all of those, all of those governments y'all were overthrown in this war. The TV series, I used to see this as the opening. Yeah, anyway. And then some people like to call it like kind of a family feud because the irony y'all is so many of these people were related, right? You had uh, people that were related. The czar was related to the Kaiser. The Kaiser was related to the king, you know, I mean, so forth and so on. Because when you're a monarch or when you're of royal blood, y'all, you just can't marry anybody. You've got to keep the bloodline pure. So you marry people who are also of royal birth. Well, there's only so many of them around. So eventually you start marrying cousins and stuff. It's kind of creepy. It's time for a here we go. So this key concept, you guys have already seen this concept. It's the major, one of the major ones of period seven. We saw this same concept when we talked about the Spanish-American War. If you remember, America's history had been one of not getting involved in wars overseas, wars with other countries, unless they come over here wanting to fight, right? Um, we tried to stay out of those. But then in 1898, we get involved in the Spanish-American War. We win it, and it's a very quick war, a splendid little war, as John Hay called it. But when the war is over, Americans are kind of uncomfortable with winning. They're uncomfortable about taking the Philippines and Agnum. And if you remember, the vote for the Treaty of Paris, which was going to end the war and give us the Philippines, passed by only a single vote. So Americans were very divided about this whole idea of going out and getting other places. This is the particular concept for World War I, the next major war we get involved in this period, as well, of course, as World War II. 
Now, just like the Spanish-American War had led to this debate about what we should be doing in the world, our role in the world, we're going to get a similar debate, y'all, as a result of, the, uh, of World War I. And in World War I, y'all, the treaty will not pass. The Treaty of Versailles fails to, to be uh, voted on, mainly because it's going to include this thing called the League of Nations have a predecessor to the United Nations. Many Americans, y'all, were left with a really bad taste in their mouth after World War I. After the war, there is, there's investigations into so-called war profiteers, uh, these people who had made money off the war. You know, before we get in the war, y'all, as you guys will see, we loaned lots of money to the French and the British. We sold them weapons. And if they lose the war, we're probably not going to get that money back. And so there's this idea that the so-called merchants of death had tricked us into World War I. And Americans are determined, y'all, that homie ain't going to be fooled again and let this happen again. And so it's going to take a lot to get us into World War II. But after World War II, y'all, we decide once and for all, we're going to stay involved in world affairs. We're going to create a alliance system, ironically, that's what made World War I so bad, called NATO, right, that's going to do this. So anyway, so Americans once again are going to debate after World War I, much less debate after World War II. So, you know, you could kind of see AP, y'all, maybe asking you to kind of compare, say, the Spanish-American War and what happened after that with World War I's aftermath with World War II or maybe our entry into those wars. All right, now history teachers, y'all, have cleverly come up with a way uh, to remember the long-term causes. Now, in most events that happen, y'all, there are main causes, long-term causes that go back even decades sometimes, all right? But then there's the spark, the short-term causes, those that precipitate the event. Now, the long-term causes have been divided into four main causes. This is a little monomic device. Y'all ever seen Johnny Monomic? Okay, you're gonna see a preview now. It's a pretty cool movie, but it's dated. It's a sci-fi movie made in the 90s, set in the year 2021. See if this is what 2021 looks like. The year is 2021. It's no longer safe to transmit information. Computers and satellites are all vulnerable. A solution. Storage capacity. I can carry nearly 80 gigs of data in my head. Input the data into the brain of a human courier like Johnny Mnemonic. I love that. 40 gigs, y'all. Wow. If we just had some way that we could put 40 gigs on something and take it where we want. Oh, it's called a flash drive. Okay. Anyway, so there you go. So these are the four, right? I didn't leave you guys room to write down imperialism. Somehow I left that off of the PowerPoint or off of the notes, but you guys can add it down there underneath the picture of the weird looking guy. We're going to talk about each of these in some detail and how they help lead to the outbreak of this war. Mainly, I mean, it's a little bit more world history, but it could be useful, especially if y'all are asked to say, talk about NATO or America's alliances and things like that. It could give you guys some good context, give you guys some good things for complexity's sake if you want to talk about that. It could, could help you that way. Now, M stands for militarism, this crazy race to build the most tanks, or they didn't have tanks yet, the most ships and the biggest armies. Alliances, these collective alliances where an attack on one would be an attack on all, kind of like a gang or something. Imperialism, this race to get the most colonies. And if you don't have colonies, you're going to have to go to war to get some. And nationalism, this love of your culture where you want 
to have your own nation for your own people, your own language. And some of these people didn't have that, like the Poles and the Croatians and the Slovenians and the Czechs and the Slovaks and all these people. They're going to want a nation. And one of those nationalists, y'all, is going to fire the shot that actually starts the war. So you have nationalism being like a long-term cause and in some ways, the immediate cause. So you know how AP works, y'all. They could ask you which of these is the greatest reason in your opinion, to what extent was imperialism the major reason or whatever like that. Okay, so let's talk about militarism first here. Now, <clears throat> during this time, y'all, before World War I, there was a naval, naval race going on. And the Germans, the Russians, the French, and lately, later, of course, the Americans had all been in this race to see who could have the most powerful and the largest number of ships. These cost billions of dollars to do. You think of all the good they could have done with that. But if somebody, a potential enemy, had more ships, well, you couldn't risk him attacking you. You had to build more ships. He, of course, would see you building more ships, so he had to build even more ships. But then in 1906, something happens. The HMS Dreadnought comes out. I'm going to let you hear a little video by a British guy. And you know he's smart because he's got a British accent. Hello, and welcome to History Pod. On the 10th of February, 1906, the British King Edward VII launched HMS Dreadnought, a revolutionary new type of battleship that made all other ships obsolete. She was the fastest and most heavily armed ship in the world, and the name Dreadnought began to be used to describe a whole new class of similar ships. You might think that having the best ship in the world would make Britain the undisputed champion of the seas, but the launch of the Dreadnought actually created more problems than it solved. Ever since the two power standard was adopted as part of the Naval Defence Act of 1889, the Royal Navy had to have at least the same number of battleships as the next two largest navies in the world combined. At that point, it was France and Russia, but by 1906, Germany had entered the fray. But why was the dreadnought a problem to the two power standard? Well, the issue was that Britain now only had one more dreadnought than every other country in the world. With all other ships obsolete in the wake of the new design, it was too easy for other countries to catch up. When Germany launched the first of its dreadnought-style Nassau ships in 1908, Britain was forced to keep ahead by building more and more. The naval arms race that followed was a major contributing factor to the outbreak of the First World War. Now, there's also a temptate, now, temptation to try to use these weapons before your enemy gets more than you do, right? Your potential enemy. Now, the Germans not only had to compete with the British at sea, and a lot of it was kind of a, an ego thing, y'all, between the German Kaiser and uh, his cousin, the King of England, but they also had to compete against the French and the Russians in armies. You know, Germany, y'all, was right in the middle between France and Russia and it would have to have an army that could fight both of those. So the Germans, y'all, they were spending like crazy, trying to compete with the British, trying to compete with the French, trying to compete with the Russians and everything like that. And here you see, very commonly, you would see patriotic, military, um, you know, marches. This is going through the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. Here you see a father with his son. Maybe instead of the Boy Scouts, they're learning how to be good soldiers. They were indoctrinating their kids at an early age for military service. By the way, this particular type of helmet is synonymous with the Germans. It's called a Pickelhalbe, and uh, it's got a point on it. I don't know if they were supposed to headbutt people with it or what the heck the use was, but uh, the Germans actually, at the beginning of the war, actually wore them with the cloth covering, but they proved to be kind of useless, and they abandoned them. But the reason I make a point about it is you guys may see a cartoon or you may see a picture as an AP document. Um, and if you see that pointy helmet, know right away that's probably the Kaiser. That is the leader of Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm. 
Now, Germany was ahead in army. Um, it was behind in the Navy, but it was ahead of France and Russia. But the Russians, y'all, were really making an effort to catch up. It was predicted by 1917, maybe 1918, that the Russian army would be the size of the German army and is modernized. So there's this temptation if you see your enemy is gaining on you and may even surpass you, you better get him now before he can defeat you. And, you know, you spend all this money on weapons and you kind of feel like it's wasted money unless you use them. And ironically, all, all that money that was spent on building those dreadnoughts, and by the way, our battleship Texas that we have was the first American dreadnought. It was built in 1914. And of course, today, it is the only dreadnought still around in the world. Uh, that makes it a really special ship. Dreadnoughts are kind of the ancestor of the modern day, modern battleship that we had in World War II. Okay, now that says Alliance. I know it's kind of blocked out by that, that little uh, picture up there. Uh, but the Triple Entente, y'all, as that name sounds, that's a French name, Entente, right? It was composed of these three countries, France, Great Britain, and Russia. You don't have to write the full name, United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. I just wanted you to know the full name. And in those days, the United Kingdom did control all of Ireland, not just the six northern counties that they have today in Northern Ireland. Um, and so Great Britain, or simply Britain, France, and Russia were all tied together, y'all, by a series of treaties where they each would have to help the other if the other got attacked or invaded. Um, now, on the other side, there was an alliance between Germany. That's the old German flag. You'll notice that it's the same colors that Hitler would have on the Nazi flag, which had the red background white circle with the black uh, swastika on it. He just took it and manipulated it for his own reasons. You also have a gigantic double empire. It was called the dual monarchy, a combination of Austria and its, its territories and Hungary and its territories. That's why you see two crowns on this, uh, this particular flag. And then you also have the Italians. Now, the irony here is you guys may remember from yesterday's video that Italy, unlike in World War II, was actually on the ally side. That's because Italy, y'all, is going to break its deal. Italy was supposed to be on the side of the central powers, but Italy chooses to stay out of the war and doesn't honor its treaty commitments. Instead, y'all, Italy will make a secret treaty with the Allies to enter the war on their side. In reward for that, they would get some territory from what was supposed to be one of their allies, Austria-Hungary. Now, alliances, y'all, they work, and it's important to understand them because today we are in an alliance called NATO, right? Um, and it's a permanent alliance. We broke 150 years of history of not signing to be in any permanent alliances after World War II. So alliances, you know, have been around for a long time. They're, they work on the gang principle. Now, if a single member of a gang is attacked, it's like you've attacked the whole gang. And so if you're smart, you won't attack a gang member because you know man, I'm going to have to fight all of them. And so that's the way these alliances work. You know, think about it with Putin, right? Now, Putin went into Ukraine because Ukraine is not part of any alliance system. It wasn't made part of NATO. Some people even think one reason Putin went in there was because he wanted to take it before it could join NATO. Um, because if it joins NATO, y'all, we are responsible for defending them. We would have to send American troops and planes. Uh, so would Poland, so would Hungary, so would Romania, so would Britain, so would Canada, Norway, so forth and so on. So an attack on one is considered, an attack on one is what it says underneath my picture here, is considered an attack on all. 
Now, theoretically, this should stop wars from happening because who wants to be fighting a bunch of countries at one time? Some people believe that Putin will just ignore that and he'll go into Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, or go into what's Poland today, just like this is Ukraine that he's gone into, y'all. But if that happens, we are obligated by treaty to go ahead and come to the defense of those countries. So hopefully that will make him think twice. But what it does mean, y'all, is if the war expands past the Ukraine into those Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, or into Poland, or into Hungary or Romania, this war will become a major world war, at least a European war, as dozens of countries will get involved. And that's essentially what happens in World War I. World War I, y'all, really should have been nothing more than a war between Austria-Hungary and its neighbor Serbia over what happened in this region known as Bosnia, okay? But because of the alliance system, Germany, Russia, France, England, and its empire all end up getting involved, and this war just really expands. So it's kind of a lesson about alliances. They can be good at preventing a war like NATO. Many people believe, y'all, if we hadn't signed the NATO deal in 1949, we would have had war with the old Soviet Union, that it has kept the peace for like 70 years now. Um, and, you know, but the thing is, if it ever is called to be used by, say, an invasion of one of those countries, then it will be a major, major war. As you can say, the feces will hit the oscillating device. So this is largely what happens to make a war between two countries become a world war. Because if you attack my country, then my allies are going to attack your country, which means your allies are going to attack my country, and it's just going to spiral out of control. Now, imperialism. We just got through doing a unit on that. You guys know that's the scramble to get colonies around the world. You guys may remember international Darwinism, this idea that if we don't get colonies while there's still colonies to get, we're going to be behind. We're going to be like that giraffe with too short a neck or that too slow zebra, and we're not going to survive. So survival means having colonies, having those markets, having those cheap resources, okay, that cheap labor. Now, the world by 1914, pretty much all of the colonies were gone. Now, what's weird about this map of the British Empire, remember the famous quote, the sun never set on the British Empire. No matter where you were in the world, y'all, at some point, the sun was shining on it. They had connections to Canada. They had Nigeria, the Sudan. They had Egypt. They had South Africa and Rhodesia, and you continue naming all on. They had um, Aden and what is today the UAE. They had what is today India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, Burma, or Myanmar, Singapore. They had Australia. They had New Zealand. Um, they had, you know, Hong Kong and some other locations. So when you went to war with Britain, y'all, it wasn't just this tiny little island of Britain. It was a good chunk of the world. The British had been some of the first to get into it, and they had a lot. Now, this is the French Empire. Now, the French Empire was concentrated, obviously, here on Africa, as well as the island of Madagascar. But also, and some of you that have maybe uh, Vietnamese ancestry, France also controlled what it called Indochina, okay? And uh, in fact, y'all, a lot of the first uh, immigrants that we had coming here after the Vietnam War, as it, or as it ended, coming from Vietnam spoke French. They had gone to French schools. This is what a lot of the upper class people in Vietnam did uh, for like the high paying jobs and the better life and stuff as they went and got educated in France and that kind of thing. So it was kind of unique seeing that. Then we had y'all the German empire. Now Germany is right here. It's a much bigger Germany than it is today. Germany controlled 
uh, parts of Africa, but it wanted more, especially the French territory. It had some islands out here. It had part of New Guinea. But the Germans, y'all, were late getting into the colonies game. Remember that cartoon where the British guy has the bag behind his back? He's perfectly happy, whereas the Germans and the Russians and the Italians are all scrambling, trying to get something before it's gone. And the Italian y'all, probably worst of all, the only colonies that the Italians could get was territory nobody wanted. Nobody had bothered to really take Libya. Turkey had taken it, but, but the, um, the Italians uh, got it back. Uh, Somalia and a few other places. Uh, so the Italian y'all particularly are looking for areas to grab some more land. Now, the last of the main causes is nationalism. Now, nationalism, y'all, is this, this, this idea that had been kind of fostered by Napoleon's uh, reign over Europe. Napoleon had kind of awakened this desire for countries and people or I should say areas, to have their own country. You know, if you have a national language, you have a national religion, you have this national culture, you don't want it to be subservient to some other group. You want your own country. This is what awakened the Poles trying to have their own country. The Slovenes or, you know, the, uh, the Croatians, the Bosnians, the Serbians, um, all these different people, the Czechs, the Slovaks, y'all, there were all these different nationalities, and a lot of them, y'all, were wanting their own country. Now, the area most in contention was known as the Balkan Peninsula. A lot of people just simply called it the Balkan. And many people, y'all, just like a lot of us always kind of had an idea when I was growing up that there was going to be a major war in the Middle East. That would be where World War III started or, you know, somewhere in Eastern Europe. People just kind of had a feeling that, man, when, the, when it gets bad, it's going to probably start by some foolish thing in the Balkans. Now, I need to kind of explain what happens here. Now, this is Serbia. Today, it's an independent country again. But after World War I, it's going to become a country known as Yugoslavia and it's gonna have a lot, lot more territory. Now, back in the day, before 1908, this area had been known as Bosnia. And the people of Bosnia, at least the Christian members of Bosnia, were very close to the Serbians, sharing the same language, same religion, same Slavic kind of background. They used the same Cyrillic alphabet. And they saw it's kind of their big brother, Russia over here. And Russia always considered itself kind of like, you know, the big brother there to protect, uh, there to protect Serbia and there to protect um, uh, Bosnia right here. Well, in 1904 and 1905, y'all, the Russians were humiliated by the Japanese and the Russo-Japanese War. Their Navy, y'all, not just one fleet, but two fleet were destroyed by the Japanese. Their army humiliated. And so the Austrians took advantage of that. And just three years after that war, the Austrians went in and they took Bosnia. They just annexed it, y'all. It'd be like if we went in and we took part of Mexico or we took a province of Canada. Like, hey, what you gonna do about it? And Russia was humiliated and basically said, look, we let you down, you know, our fellow Slavs, but we won't let that happen again. We won't let that happen to Serbia. We won't let that happen to anybody else in the future. And that's important to remember. So you've got this Russian nationalism going on. You also have nationalists in Serbia, y'all, who want to get Bosnia back and include it in their own bigger country. And in fact, y'all, it's going to be a Serbian national, a Serbian terrorist, who's going to fire the shot in Sarajevo that's going to set up this just chain of events that get us into World War I. Now, there was also a type of nationalism going on between the French and the Germans. Now, a lot of people, y'all, I don't know if you guys have heard the term chauvinism. Back when I was a kid or younger, you know, if a woman wanted to say a man was acting kind of like a pig, that a man wanted the woman to have a traditional role, they'd call them chauvinists. 
Uh, and that word actually comes from France. A lot of people think it has to do with the way males act, but really chauvinism is a type of exaggerated patriotism, a patriotism, y'all. And that's what the French had. They had this really exaggerated sense of, of nationalism, of love of country. And they had been humiliated just 44 years before. Now, what had happened was the Prussians had unified many German states into a country called Germany. Now, Prussia wanted territory here. It wanted this territory. And so what it did, y'all, was it engineered. It you know, tricked the French, essentially, into going into a war that they weren't ready to fight. The Germans, y'all, just absolutely destroyed the French. And they weren't just content to beat them. They rubbed their noses in it. You know, you can be a good victor and treat your enemy with respect, or you can humiliate them and cause problems for decades. That's what the Germans did. Now, when the war came to an end, the Germans made the French sign the peace treaty in the proudest building that the French had. I mean, it would be like the Washington Monument, the White House, the uh, Capitol building, all these things tied up together. It was the Palace of Versailles. And this is where the French had to sign their surrender. And it was an embarrassing surrender. They had to pay millions and millions of dollars to pay for the war. This is what we call war reparations. You pay to repair everything. They also, the French, y'all, were required to give up these territories of Alsace and Lorraine. Now, this humiliated the French. And children, y'all, grew up hating the Germans, wanting revenge, right? Wanting revenge for what had happened in this Franco-Prussian war. They wanted those territories back. They wanted to make Germany pay for reparations. So in this war, when they get a chance to go to war, y'all, a lot of French were initially pretty excited. This is our chance to get back at them, right? And so this is another type of nationalism that you guys have going on. Now, the major players of 1914 to 1918, now, the, uh, the Triple Entente people, y'all, are going to eventually become known as the Allies or the Allied Powers. They're going to have the same name in World War II. King George was the constitutional monarch of Great Britain. Now, he was a king, and he has more power than, say, the Queen of England does today. But pretty much, y'all, Parliament ran the war. But the king did have some influence. Now, the king had a cousin, okay, named Nicholas. Nicholas was the czar of Russia. Czar is a title. It comes from the word Caesar. Notice how it kind of looks like Caesar, right? And this was his title. Now, he was the cousin here, all right, of this man. This man's wife was the granddaughter of his grandmother, okay? And there were all kinds of other connections that these two had. The Frenchman was a president. He was an elected person. He wasn't a monarch named Juan Carré. All right. <coughs> what will become known as the Central Powers, the Triple Alliance countries, were led by this man, William II. Now, he did have the Reichstag, this, uh, or Bundestag, or whatever he had. I can't remember what it was called, but he did pretty much control the country. Maybe not as much as the czar, who was a complete autocrat, had all the power he wanted, but he had tremendous power over his country. And in some ways, you could say he was kind of a dictator. Now, the Kaiser, y'all, was the grandson of Queen Victoria. George V, the leader of Britain, was the grandson of Queen Victoria. So these people were all related. That's why we sometimes kind of consider it to be a family feud. Now, his title was the Kaiser. And if you know your Latin, in Latin, y'all, they don't say Caesar. It's like Kaiser, okay? And that's where that comes from. You and I pronounce as C's. They pronounce as keys, okay, or cakes. Um, and so he was known as William II, Wilhelm II, 
but a lot of Americans, y'all, just called him Kaiser Bill. Now, look at his distinctive handlebar mustache. A good portion of his day, y'all, was devoted to waxing and maintaining that. I think he even had a barber on hand pretty much full time to deal with that mustache. Now, this man was a very, very vain man. Some people even think he was a little bit cracked, y'all, a little bit kind of crazy. He definitely had issues. Let's just say it that way. Now, his birth had been kind of interesting because when his mother, who was the daughter of Queen Victoria, um, his, his mother, Vicky, gave birth to him, y'all, as he was coming through the birth canal, he got stuck, right? I don't know if you ever had that happen, but it's pretty miserable. And they had to reach in there with some forceps and grab him and pull him out. Now, what they did is they messed up his left arm. And that arm was never very useful. They called it a withered arm. It just kind of hung there. And it was always much smaller than his other arm. Now, this caused him great embarrassment. A lot of people believe it caused him some psychological issues as well, too, because he always felt kind of inferior. Right? you got to remember Germans, too, y'all. You know, the manliness, this German kind of thing of being stronger and more powerful than everybody else. And here this guy is basically kind of a one-armed dude. And his father, you know, he was meaning well. His father, like, made him do everything that everybody else did, but he could only do one arm. Imagine riding a horse one arm. Poor kid just falling off the horse all the time. And, um, and he even had his uniforms made, you know, to kind of hide it, where it would be a shorter sleeve. And any time people took a picture, he'd always kind of, you know, turn to an angle not to do this. Now, they even, you know, not to be seen. Now, if you guys have seen the movie The Kingsman, right, the new one, uh, and I meant to try to get a clip out of that, and I didn't get a chance to do it. They have all three of these guys played by the same person. Because if you really do kind of look at them, they look a lot alike, and it's no accident, y'all. They all shared, like, the same parents and grandparents and stuff like that. But I thought it was kind of interesting. So the Kaiser, King George V, and Nicholas II, y'all, these will be the monarchs behind this war. Okay, and that's why like, so we call it the Fall of Eagles. Now, this guy, Emperor Franz Josef, underneath there it says Austria-Hungary, the dual monarchy. Now, this guy was old. I mean, like, older than Mr. D. Old. He, he went back. He'd come to power in 1848, 66 years before that guy had come to power. So he was in his 80s, probably getting close to 90. And in those days, that meant pretty old. Now, of course, somebody that's old, you've got to think about, okay, who's taking over for him when he does a decent thing and dies? Well, his, it would be his, um, it would have been his son, Rudolph. But Rudolph, y'all, and imagine having that name. Rudolph had gotten in some trouble. He got involved in a relationship with this woman, and uh, it didn't end well. It ended up by him killing himself. I can't remember if he killed her or not, but it went back. He blew his brains out. And his dad was just devastated. So there goes his only kid that can take over for him. So it next falls to his brother. Well, he outlives his brother. So then it falls to his brother's son, Francis Joseph, Joseph or Franz Ferdinand, who I'm sure you guys have heard about. Now, he didn't care much for his nephew. Didn't even like him, to be honest, because he let him down. His nephew, y'all, had gotten involved with this woman named Sophia Kotek. Kotek? It was a weird kind of name. But had gotten involved with Sophie, or Sophie, as some people call her. And uh, the problem was she was not of royal birth. Now, you and I, it doesn't matter who we marry like that, but if you're royalty, you can't marry somebody who's not. Because what that means is your children will not be able to become a monarch. And they absolutely humiliated his wife. He couldn't even come into a dinner, an official dinner with his wife. He would have to come in with other people of royal birth or princesses or whatever, dukes or whatever. And his wife would be the last to come in. And even when they had their funeral, y'all, they put his coffin 
dust up a little bit higher than her. Okay. And they even had some of it at night so nobody would go there. So he hated. He had no no respect for his nephew. But still, if you shoot my nephew, even if I don't like my nephew, we got problems. And that's exactly what's going to happen to him. Now, there's a couple dates you guys need to know. I don't ask you guys to learn lots of dates. Um, but here's a couple. Obviously, you should know when the war starts. August 1914. This war expands from a Serbian-Austrian war in July to a world war by August of 1914. Yeah, was it August August of 1914? Okay. Why is 1917 important? That's when we get into the war. So we managed to stay out of this war, y'all, for three years. And in April 1917... And that's going to be what we're going to talk about on Monday. Events are going to get us into this war. Okay. We're going to end up entering the war on the allied side. Now, lots of times, you know, we Americans, y'all, we'll take credit for stuff we probably shouldn't take credit for. Um, but we really do deserve credit for ending World War I. We go to war in April 1917. We don't even really have large numbers of men and materials over there until the end of 1917. The war is over, y'all, a year after we get in it. In 1918, the Germans, the Turks, the Austra, Austrian. All right, y'all, so a little square down here now. Hopefully that'll be better for y'all to see. But anyway, um, when this war starts, you notice how I talked about the alliance system being a big problem and and, you know, this is useful. I know y'all are saying, Mr. D, this isn't American history. This is world history. But it's useful, y'all, when you guys start talking about, like, NATO after World War II, America's reluctance, maybe America's reluctance also, y'all, to join the League of Nations. Because we saw how this alliance system dragged a lot of people into war, and it made us even more nervous to be part of one, okay? Um, and some people viewed the League of Nations almost kind of like an alliance where, we would all join against some oppressor or something somewhere. So anyway, y'all, once the war begins, the Triple Alliance countries are going, I mean, the Triple uh, Alliance countries are going to be uh, as the, um, and this is actually down here a little bit, it's a little bit further. Uh, the Triple Alliance countries are going to become known as the Allies. And essentially, y'all, these are still the allies in World War II. Of course, France gets knocked out of the war really quickly, and the United States will join. Russia by then is the Soviet Union. But still, the allies will be known as the allies in World War II. That's a continuation that y'all could mention. So that's what the Triple Entente countries uh, become known as after the war. Okay? Now, if you move back up in your notes, the Triple Alliance countries they become known as the Central Powers. And if you know some basic geography, you can see why, because they're all located in the center of Europe. But then something interesting happens here, y'all. Italy, which will not be an ally in World War II, Italy initially stays out of the war, and Italy is convinced, basically, by being promised territory from Austria by the victors, that if Italy joins in the war, uh, on the side of the Allies, they will get this territory. And replacing Italy will be the Ottoman Empire. And this is an awful mistake for the Ottoman Empire, y'all, because the Ottoman Empire, modern-day Turkey, but in those days, y'all, it included some of North Africa. It included a lot of the Middle East today. By being on the wrong side and losing, the Ottoman Empire will lose that empire and be reduced to basically the country of Turkey today. All right, so that kind of ends this part for y'all. Um, the next part uh, is about the causes of the war. I'm going to probably make that optional, extra credit for the people who have the time. We'll go ahead and stop this part right there.